Okay, one, one last time for this message. Um, again, the t original title for the session was something like What's New in Databricks, something like that. Uh, this session is actually on Lakehouse Monitoring. The reason we had to obscure the title was it was embargoed because we announced the product this morning. So if you don't want to be here for data and AI quality, we forgive you and you can leave. Otherwise, this is the right place to be. Also, if you do want to go to a similar session to like what's new or what this session claimed to be, it will actually be tomorrow and it's going to be called something like Deep Dive Lakehouse AI. Um, and Nicholas is the presenter there. That will be the session to go to. It's like Nicholas and Ankit. Um, and that will be the closest thing that we have to sort of like a what's new in Databricks uh, for machine learning. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us in today's session on Lakehouse Monitoring, which we just announced this morning. This is a universal solution for monitoring your data and AI assets in Databricks. Uh, I'm Casey Ullenhut. I'm a product manager lead on the machine learning platform team at Databricks. And I'm joined by my esteemed colleague. You want to introduce yourself? Um, I'm Alex Polizotis. <laughs> That's it? That's it. Senior staff engineer at Databricks, one of the ideators of this incredible product. I'll introduce him for him. Um, all right, so, uh, yada, yada, yada. Okay, so I'm gonna just like quickly breeze through the setup because I think we all know why we want to monitor. And then we're gonna jump straight into the demo that Alcus is gonna do because that's the most exciting part. Uh, so really quick, this is, these are the motivations for why we built Lakehouse Monitoring. So the first is we have customers that say things like this, like, oh, I forgot to use update on the table I was writing to. And then I end up having a teammate told me they were having trouble querying this table. And it's because my table ended up having three million rows in it rather than a couple thousand. And so how are they supposed to know that this happens? They only find out when a teammate comes and tells them about it. Or they have a reference table and it's missing a value when it was updated. And so now an entire geography's data got dropped because it can't join. And then now you only figure out it's going to happen because some data analyst down the road for that geography is like, hey, where did all my data go? And then you might have something, oh, sorry, clicker problems. Okay. And then you might have something like this if you're on the ML team where your team ends up training models, but they end up being kind of like one-off solutions because you don't really know how they're performing. And then after a couple of months, you just turn the models off because they don't really seem to be doing the job anymore. People are complaining and they're not really doing what they're meant to do. And now it's as if you didn't even build a machine learning model to begin with. So these are the kind of situations that we're hearing over and over again from our customers and have motivated our lake house monitoring solution. So between all these scenarios, here are like the core problems that we're seeing. Uh, the first is, what we really think about it, data teams want to provide SLAs not only on delivery, but also on data quality. And the reasons they want to do this is because they often find they're doing reactive issue management. So it's only when someone complains that they know something went terribly wrong in their pipeline. Because the data pipeline executes correctly, but something went terribly wrong inside. And it's only when someone complains to them that they actually find out something went wrong. There's also this like problem of bottlenecked operations, where you're finding that you can't have the self-service experience. It's like everyone always has to go through the data team or data engineering in order to figure out what data set they need to use, clean the PII, et cetera. And so it sort of reduces your democratization of data across your organization. And then there's just inefficient processes, where you end up, for example, retraining a model every week, because you know that's when new data comes in and you're just hoping you catch errors along the way and you're just gonna blindly retrain it. 
rather than knowing exactly when you should retrain your model. And it also is really hard if you do have a data quality issue to then roll back those problems in that written table uh, to fix it and now have a more accurate table uh, there. So then you could use a monitoring solution, but the monitoring solutions that we've heard from customers today aren't quite cutting it. So they're either high friction, where it takes a ton of time. Like you have to set up all your monitors, you have to build your own dashboards, and you have to configure all your own alerts. And so the barrier to using these products is too high and they don't even use it. Or they're not flexible enough. Like a lot of people have custom metrics. There's a very specific domain specific metric that you need to measure and the solution that you have doesn't support it. Or the other problem that you have is your data engineering team is using an entirely different monitoring tool than your data science team. But your ML lifecycle goes across data and AI. And so now you have to like piece together quality across these different tools and it just is complicated and weirdly siloed. So these are sort of the problems that we're seeing out there that we're trying to address with Lakehouse monitoring. So at its core, we believe that data quality needs to actually be built into the data platform. And that's sort of the high level of like philosophy that we're taking in the solution that we're building. So what does this actually look like? So I'm gonna to paint to you a quick dream of what it means when you can actually put data quality into the platform itself. The first is you can get something like this. So imagine this is a beautiful uh, mock-up instead of a PM mock-up. Uh, but this is an example of what your Unity catalog could look like, where I don't know if you can quite see, but there's little error circles next to tables in here, and you're seeing a squiggle in the SQL editor, letting you know that the table you're trying to query has a data integrity issue. And so you now know in the moment when you're trying to do your work that actually maybe the table that you're writing is flaky and it's not reliable enough for you to build an important financial forecast on. Ooh. Another thing you might see is root cause analysis. So now you have your end-to-end -end lineage chain. Something goes wrong with your model predictions. But if you backtrack it, it actually turns out it's something from your raw source table where the number of nulls increased dramatically and now you're having prediction drift. And you need to be able to go back in time and see that. And you can only get that if data quality is built into this Lakehouse platform. And then you might have something like this, where you can have automatic alerting. So whenever a metric falls below a threshold, we, like all your data and metadata is in a single place, so the appropriate thresholds can be learned and they can be adapted as your data changes. And so you can get these automatic Slack alerts letting you know, hey, something's changed, you have a drift, you need to check this out, here's the dashboard to investigate further. And lastly, in this beautiful world that we can create where we actually integrate data quality into the platform itself, is you can now have AI-based data classification. So now we can automatically from, like, well, we hopefully will be able to, automatically detect PII, apply policies to it, mask it, things like that, all in this platform now because all your data, metadata, again, single place, data quality is built in as a first class experience. So this is like the dream that we're building towards. Hopefully not much of it won't be a dream for that much longer, but this is like what we're building towards and Lake House Monitoring is just the first building block towards this dream. So with that, we're very excited to announce today Lake House Monitoring is going public preview very soon. It's going to public preview this fall. Uh, it's in private preview right now. Some of you in this room have already been it. That's all the like, setup I'm going to give. And now the most important part is just seeing it in practice in a demo. And so I'm going to hand it off to Alkis to demo this product and why we built it the way we did. Thanks, Casey. All right. So uh, to set up the demo a little bit, um, I'm going to assume that I work at a consumer company. And one of our priorities is to avoid customer churn. So for this purpose, um, I've built a model that predicts when my customers are going to churn based on their uh, purchasing patterns. And then for those customers who are predicted to churn, I will go ahead and take some action maybe to convince them otherwise or to prevent that. So what you see here on screen is um, a simplified lineage view of my pipeline to do this churn prediction. Uh, my main table is this uh, table that has my customer purchasing requests. Um, I will join this table uh, with a feature table that is keyed by uh, an ID for each one of my users and that gives me additional metadata for my users. And this joint input of purchases and uh, customer user metadata will go into my model 
and then I'll write the predictions um, and the inputs to this uh, third table, uh, which we call an inference table. We'll be coming back to this paradigm again and again in this demo. Uh, basically, this is our way of taking a model and giving it a tabular representation on top of which we can do uh, further analysis. Okay. Um, and I also mentioned that my uh, user features uh, table is the joint of two more tables, one that has information about countries for my users and one has information about my users. And we'll see that a little bit later. Now, if I squint, right, I can see that sort of some part of this lineage graph is what you would typically call a machine learning pipeline. Uh, it has my model inputs and model outputs. And some other part of my pipe of the graph here um, Let's see, the clicker is not advancing, but there you go. Um, is what we'll call the data engineering pipeline. And there's a little bit of an overlap between them, uh, but the advantage of Lakehouse monitoring is that it will give you a unified and consistent way of monitoring your assets across the machine learning use cases and the data engineering use cases. You'll be able to understand how failures in your assets are correlated across these uh, lineage graphs, and this will um, help you get to the root cause of these failures faster and to the right fix. All right, so uh, let me switch out of slides now and uh, start with the demo. Um, so in this case, because I care about the quality of my term prediction model, I enabled monitoring on this uh, inference table that is on the upper right uh, of the slide. And uh, lo and behold, I got an alert from Lakehouse monitoring in my pager duty um, setup saying basically that Lakehouse monitoring, yes, has uh, detected a high uh, prediction drift uh, alert. And it also gives me a link to a dashboard that I can click through uh, to get more information, okay? So let me actually zoom out and uh, click on this dashboard. So what you'll see here is a Databricks uh, dashboard, SQL dashboard, that monitoring has automatically generated for me when I enabled uh, monitoring on this uh, inference table over here. Uh, the dashboard visualizes metrics that Lakehouse Monitoring maintains in the background to help me understand the quality of my data. Now, um, I got to this dashboard from uh, the alert that I received, but if I go to the uh, Data Explorer page for my table in the, uh, in the Unity Catalog, uh, let's see, Unity Catalog doesn't respond. Nope, it's coming up. So if I go to this page here, you'll see that every uh, entry, every, pay, every table in the unit catalog now has a quality tab, and this quality tab basically shows me all the information that monitoring maintains from my table, and I also get a link to the same dashboard that I got through my alert. So this dashboard is always available to me uh, when I look at my data. All right, so zoom out again. Let's go back to the dashboard. Um, Again, the dashboard visualizes a bunch of metrics that monitoring uh, maintains for me in the background. I'll tell you more about the metrics a little bit later. But for the time being, uh, what I notice here up front is that, uh, first of all, we have significant prediction drift, which is the source of our alerts. Um, and if I look at the uh, charts in the dashboards, I notice that the model quality has actually taken a dip in the most recent window of data. And not only that, but on this chart here, uh, this estimated uh, sales loss, I noticed that um, this is going up. Now, this estimated sales loss is a custom metric that I registered with Lakehouse Monitoring to link the quality of my model to a business line metrics. So it allows me to understand if quality goes down, how much does it actually affect my business, okay? In this case, it seems that it does affect my business. Uh, this is a serious regression for my model, so I should do something about it. I should take action. Now, if I stop at this point, if this were the only information that I have available, maybe uh, a reasonable action would be to say, let's retrain the model. I notice prediction drift, quality is going down. I know that the dip in quality is important for me, um, so let's retrain it. And in fact, Lakehouse monitoring uh, can allow me to automate this process. So whenever this alert is triggered, automatically fire a retraining pipeline. But actually, Lakehouse monitoring allows me to go a step further to understand what's happening. And in this case, let me go back to the um, linear, to the uh, table, to the inference table, and specifically look at its lineage. 
And the reason is that I want to understand not just if my table is failing at this point, I want to understand what other failures are happening in my system because typically failures are correlated. They don't happen in isolation. So if I go to the lineage graph um, and I bring it up, uh, let me also zoom in a little bit. Now, this is sort of the lineage graph that you were looking at uh, earlier. This is my inference table in which monitoring is enabled. You see that Lakehouse Monitoring has annotated this graph now with all the failures and alerts that have been detected. So I see the monitoring alert, which was, again, uh, the starting point uh, of our demo and our investigation. But I also see that an upstream table, this user features table, also has an alert. So at this point, I'm becoming suspicious. It makes sense to understand this upstream failure first before I decide to take action on my model because this might be actually the source of all my uh, problems. So I will click on this, uh, click through the table uh, to get to the Data Explorer view of the table. Again, because this table is monitored, I can go to the Quality tab, click on view the dashboard, and now I find myself uh, in another dashboard. Again, this is automatically generated by Lakehouse Monitoring. Uh, it visualizes metrics for this table. And one thing you'll notice when the dashboard loads up is that it looks slightly different from the other dashboard. And the reason is that in this table, um, I don't have any machine, I don't have the inputs and outputs of a model. I only have what you call a pure data engineering case. So the metrics that Lakehouse Monitoring computes are specific to this case, right? So they differ a little bit. So let's see what's going on here. So one thing that I'll immediately notice is that there is a column with a high number, with a high percentage of nulls detected for this table. And moreover, if I look at this chart, which tells me the count of columns with high nulls over time, I see that this is a recent increase, okay? So this is not always the case with my table. Something started happening recently, okay? So this is not worthy. Uh, let me see if I can also detect which column is the one that has the high number of nulls. So I go to this table, I sort uh, based on the number of percentage of nulls, and I see that this uh, country churn rate, and I'll zoom in, this country churn rate is the one that seems to have a high number of nulls, okay? So this is, this is a good uh, data point. I'll keep that in mind. Um, I also noticed from my... Um, quick uh, uh, gauge metrics over here at the top that there is drift happening in my columns. Seems that some categorical columns and one numerical column, they have changed the distributions recently, okay? So let me try to understand that. So I'll scroll down to the section of the dashboard that um, shows me uh, drift. And let me try to see if I can uh, find again which column has the highest drift and I sort by the p-value of a, a chi-square test here to understand which has drifted the most. Um, and if I go to this side, I see that, oops, country is the column with the highest drift. And it has high drift not just according to the statistical test for chi-square, it has high drift according to a bunch of metrics, drift metrics that Lakehouse Monitoring is computing for, uh, for the columns in the table. Okay, so, um, I know that country churn rate is null, and now it seems that country is drifting. This starts to form a little bit of a, you know, the pieces of the puzzle falling in place. And if I look a little bit further down at the actual distribution of the columns, um, if I look at the distribution of country, I can see that the number of unique values increased in the latest window. And if I actually look at the um, distribution of these values, I see that country has both US and USA, okay? And this is definitely suspicious. I would not expect uh, to encode country using, you know, the same country using two different values. This seems to be pointing to some data normalization problem, okay? So how can I uh, investigate further? Well, if I go back to the lineage graph, uh, which was over here, and I'll expand a little bit on this side, uh, if I look at the columns of this table on which I'm seeing the alerts, country, um, is coming from the user info table, okay? And this is basically the, the power of having lineage as a first class citizen as well in the platform. So I know that these US, USA values are appearing on this side on the user info table. And country churn rate, which was the null column, comes from the other side, from the country info table, okay? And it's super easy for me now to sort of uh, do the final verification. What's happening here is an outer join. So I'm doing an outer join between user info and country. Uh, user info has this US value which doesn't appear in country, so I get a null country churn rate. Uh, and it's very easy to verify that. I can just go, uh, oops, 
can go here and um, fire off a quick query, look at the distinct values in country info, and I'll see that the US doesn't appear in them, okay? So I could run the query, but trust me, the results are not very exciting. Basically, we identified the root cause. So at this point, um, I know what I want, need to do for the fix. I need to do some data normalization of my user info, rerun my pipelines, and see if I can actually mitigate the problem that I was seeing here originally on my table on the inference table, okay? So if we uh, take a step back, what has happened so far? With lake house monitoring, I got an alert that there was an error condition in my data. Also, th also through lake house monitoring, I had access to dashboards with several pre-computed metrics that allowed me to dig into the problem a little bit more and understand what's happening. Lake house monitoring also annotated for me the lineage graph. So then I could go to the lineage graph and understand are failures correlated and do I need to be looking upstream for the root cause of my problem? And I was able to find the root cause. Now I can apply the fix. And equally importantly, I was able to avoid uh, taking actions that would cost me time and money and would not solve the problem. So for instance, if I were to retrain the model immediately, most likely this would not solve my problem in this case, and I would have burned money uh, doing that because you know, retraining can be uh, potentially costly. All right. Now, I describe this uh, scenario sort of, you know, uh, straddling both machine learning and data engineering, but it's very easy to see that exactly the same methodology and the same scenario can work in a pure data engineering uh, use case. So uh, as an example, I have created this uh, customer segmentation table, which takes the user purchasing patterns and some metadata and uh, aggregates it across different dimensions. And the whole idea is that I'm using this uh, to drive a business intelligence dashboard that I want to share with my shareholders, okay? So this is a case where there is no machine learning, it's pure data engineering. Um, and if I look at the lineage graph here, I can see that um, I will get alerts on this table. I enable the cast monitoring on this table that's powering my dashboard because I care for the quality of the dashboard. So I want to know if this table has any errors. So I can see that there is an error for the table powering the dashboard. And again, I can correlate it with upstream errors, uh, which help me understand where I should try to fix things rather than you know, uh, taking quick actions. All right. So now that you saw what uh, Lake House Monitoring can uh, help you with, what it can offer, um, let me show you how you actually enable it on different uh, parts of the catalog. So I'll uh, jump back to uh, the Data Explorer. Let's start from here. Um, I created basically a uh, copy of my tables that are not monitored so that we can see exactly how it's set up. And I'll start with the user features table. So this is the data engineering table, and then we'll move to the machine learning uh, use case. All right, so um, again, sorry, let me zoom out. Um, for any table in your Unity catalog, uh, you get a quality tab, and this is sort of your starting point uh, to configure lake house monitoring. Now, um, monitoring will work with any uh, delta format table in the Unity catalog, regardless of how you generated this table. So it doesn't matter if this table was generated through DLT or whether you had a you know, conventional uh, ingestion pipeline or you used DBT to bring it in. Uh, Lake House Monitoring will work uniformly across all of these cases. So uh, I click on Get Started, and I am presented with this uh, pop-up. Now, the first thing that I need to um, determine here is the kind of analysis that I want Lake House Monitoring to do on this table. And we have uh, a few options here. The first one, the snapshot profile, basically analyzes every version of this table separately. So you can see over time, as your table gets updated, what the different versions of the table look like and how they compare to each other. The second option um, assumes that there is a timestamp per row in the table, and you're sort of encoding a time series in your table. So in that case, what monitoring will do is it will sort of understand how this timestamp evolves over time across the different versions of the table, and it will allow me to compute metrics uh, for different windows of this time series. So this is actually the case for this table. So I'll pick time series. And now I have to select which column has a timestamp. Uh, this is the timestamp column. 
and I can select uh, how I want to group my uh, time series in Windows based on duration uh, and this timestamp. And let's say that in this case, I want to do daily uh, aggregations, so I'll pick this. And notice also that you can pick several aggregations together if you want to examine your data at different granularities at the same time. So you can say I want both daily, but I also want to look at it on a monthly basis if you want to sort of zoom out a little bit. So I'll pick daily, and I will also keep PII detection enabled here. Uh, this is just uh, one more set of metrics that we compute uh, for the tables, and you'll see that in a little bit. All right. Now that I've determined what class of metrics I want to compute over my uh, table, the next thing is to determine uh, how often these metrics will be uh, refreshed. Um, so I pick a schedule. Uh, let's say that I want to do this uh, every uh, 12, sorry, every 12 hours. Um, you know, you can obviously uh, pick a more frequent uh, refresh if you need. What happens is that uh, Lake House monitoring will work in the background running the, according to the schedule and analyzing the contents of the table to compute these metrics. Now, uh, two things I want to note here. The first one is when data monitoring runs its background refresh, it takes into account how the table changed uh, after the last successful refresh, okay? So we, we try to understand which parts of the table changed and we only process these parts and maybe a little bit more in order to refresh the metrics efficiently. So we're not doing from scratch recomputation every time we do this background uh, refresh of the metrics. The other thing, and it's important to note here, is that I don't have to specify any compute to do this refresh. Lakehouse monitoring relies on serverless compute. So it will pick the right uh, cluster, the right size, the right dependencies, and just run it in the background. As a user, I don't have to worry about this. Okay. All right, so moving on with the uh, uh, options here, I do have to specify where I want uh, output tables to appear, and you'll see why this is important in a little bit. So I'm, I'm picking the schema name with the catalog. Um, and one option that I can configure here is slicing expressions, which allows me to compute metrics, not just for the overall uh, table, but also for subsets of the table. So for instance, previously we saw that country was a column that had weird behaviors. Um, and maybe what I want to do here is specify that I want to slice by country. This basically means that um, I'll get overall metrics for my table, but also get metrics for every distinct value of country that appears in my table so that I can zoom in on specific subpopulations of the data. Uh, the last thing here is to add custom metrics, which um, I think I'll illustrate a little bit better in the next part of the demo, so I'll skip this for now. And then uh, once I've specified all of this, I can uh, click uh, Create. This will start the creation of the, the enablement of monitoring in the background and the analysis. Uh, this will take some time, but at the end of it, you'll basically get a dashboard that looks uh, exactly like this. Okay, actually, I created this dashboard using exactly the same parameters that I put in uh, that model. So um, it's important to keep in mind that this dashboard doesn't do any computation. Okay, this dashboard only uh, retrieves the metrics that have been computed in the background and visualizes them in different charts and different sections. Uh, with respect to the metrics that we uh, compute, um, I can give you a brief walkthrough. Let me just zoom in. Um, so, oops. We have metrics that uh, help you understand the distribution of the data uh, in the table. This is what we call summer statistics, and you know, they, they differ based on the uh, type of the data for numerical and uh, categorical columns. Metrics that help you understand the integrity of your data. So do you see a lot of nulls, a lot of zeros, a lot of NANs, uh, what is uh, the percent? And drift metrics, which help you understand how the distributions change over time um, in your data. Um, and also how some of these integrity metrics change over time. So is it that your count of nulls have showed up recently, for instance? Um, and you'll see that we actually have a lot of uh, drift metrics that we compute. Uh, basically, we want to give you um, a way that you can understand better how data changes over time instead of just giving you uh, one drift metric. All right, so these are the, the metrics. Uh, now, all of these metrics, um, and these metrics are now visualized in different sections of the, of the uh, dashboard. Um, let me take a brief stop here in the PII section. So you saw that I left PII detection enabled for this data set. 
Um, we analyzed the data for uh, some classes of PII. In this case, we had 932 detections that happened. It appears that all of them are in a single column. Um, and I can also see how these detections evolve over time. So am I getting more or less um, and so on. And um, one of the things that happens here is that if lake house monitoring detects PII, it actually automatically tags the column in the Unity catalog. Um, and this tagging can now enable further automation. So you can start to mask data when this tag is present, or you can alert some data curator to take a look and see, okay, is this truly PII? Do we have to do something about it? How does it affect other parts uh, of our business? Um, all right. Now, let me come back a little bit to the metrics uh, story. As I said, the dashboard doesn't um, do any computation. It only uh, visualizes metrics that exist, uh, that monitoring has already computed. And uh, these metrics are stored in this, uh, sorry, in this output tables. So as you run Lakehouse monitoring, you get two more tables in your account, one that has uh, profile metrics and another one that has drift metrics. And these are just uh, normal tables. So let me just uh, click here to open the analysis metrics table. This is a table in your account. Um, you can take this table and share it with stakeholders. Um, you can decide if you want to run a query over this table because you want to uh, do some analysis that is not in our dashboard, or you can run further uh, analysis in a notebook, uh, or if you prefer to have your dashboards in an external tool, you can take this table and visualize it through Power BI or Tableau using the existing uh, Databricks uh, connectors. So you have a lot of uh, flexibility on what you can do with these uh, uh, tables. Um, and another thing that I want to note here for the dashboard itself is that this is a dashboard in your account. So you can share it with your stakeholders. You can also customize it to your heart's extent. You can bring in more charts. You can bring in more data to the same dashboard. Anything that they can help you understand um, how you want to uh, govern the quality um, of the data. All right. So um, we saw what happens for a pure data engineering scenario, how you set up monitoring. Now let's switch to the machine learning scenario. So how do I set up monitoring uh, for um, an inference uh, table? So let me close the Linux graph, uh, go again back to my uh, copy of the table that doesn't have monitoring. All right. So. Um, this uh, inference table, again, is the table that stores the input requests to my model and the predictions that are coming out of, our, of, of my model. Um, these kind of tables are generated typically when you have a batch scoring pipeline. Uh, you sort of generate them on the fly, and you know, we've heard from many customers that they also store these tables. This is actually what's happening for my example here. But um, if you're serving your model in Databricks through model serving, we will create this table automatically for you. So every request that goes into model serving gets written down to a table in Unity Catalog. Um, if you're serving your, your model outside of Databricks, then you can ETL the request log of that model in Databricks and then apply monitoring on it. So basically the idea here is that regardless of how you serve your model, batch scoring in Databricks, uh, online model serving in Databricks, or external serving, you have a way to bring everything in again and to enable lakehouse monitoring. So uh, I'll click on Get Started. Let me zoom in a little bit. Now, in this case, I'll pick the last uh, analysis type, this inference profile, because I have these requests, these model requests that are coming in the predictions, and I want a different class of metrics. So I first have to pick uh, what problem type uh, my model represents. I'll pick classification uh, for this case, because again, this is the churn prediction. Um, and I have to specify in which columns uh, I have chosen to store different aspects of this request. So I need to say where is the prediction, and I uh, have a prediction column for that. I can also specify a column where I store the ground truth. And the idea here is that once I have a table that has the input requests and predictions, I can join in the ground truth labels later as they arrive in my system. So I can have a single table that has everything that I need to know uh, about my model. So in this case, I uh, joined the actual churn of customers in this churn column. Um, and by the way, this is an optional uh, column. You don't have to specify it, or you can come in and specify it later. And it can have missing information as well if you haven't received yet your ground truth. 
Now, um, we're assuming the requests are timestamped again, so I'll, I'll pick here uh, the timestamp column for the requests. And again, I can, similar to the time series profile we saw earlier, I can group these requests in windows, time windows, to see their metrics. And let's say that I'll pick daily in this case. Um, the last column, which is the model ID, uh, is interesting. It basically allows you to aggregate requests from several models in the same table. So in my case, for instance, I'm using you know, one specific version to do churn prediction. Maybe uh, tomorrow I come up with a different version of the model. It uses different features, different architecture, what have you. And I want to understand how does this version compare to the previous one for the same uh, customer, uh, for the same basically serving traffic. So I can log everything to the same table and I can give this model ID column a different value and now monitoring will segment the metrics based on this model ID. So I can see the metrics for the whole table as if uh, I was serving both of these, but I can also see them separately for the two models and I can compare them for A-B testing or for model evaluation after deploying a production and so on. All right, so the schedule is something that we already covered. I'll just leave it at daily for now. Um, again, let me um, specify where I want my output metric tables to be stored. Um, and here for uh, slicing and custom metrics, we'll do something different. So for slicing, um, there is a column in my data that is gender. And I, I want to know whether my model is actually being fair with respect to some aspect of this. So I'll pick the size and expression uh, gender is equal to zero, which basically means that monitoring now will compute separate metrics just for the part of the traffic that corresponds to gender equals zero and metrics for the remaining traffic, okay? And uh, it will also give me additional metrics, uh, fairness and bias metrics that I will be able to use to compare those two slices and understand is my model being fair or biased against this specific uh, gender value. So I'll leave that in. And for the custom metric, uh, this is what I was uh, mentioning earlier. Uh, I would like to have this uh, estimated monetary loss of model news predictions uh, for uh, churn. So I'll give it a name, uh, sales loss, and here I can write a SQL expression that is the definition uh, of this metric. Um, so I always get the SQL expression wrong, so let me just copy paste it from here. It's not super complicated, but let's not mess it now. And I was here, oops, all right. And the, the expression basically takes the confusion matrix that monitoring already computes for me um, and filters out a specific type of errors in this matrix and scales them by some uh, factor that from historical data, I know this is sort of how much I'm losing in sales whenever I make this specific uh, kind of errors. So by doing that now, this custom metric, the sales loss will become one of the metrics that Lakehouse Monitoring maintains. And it's sort of at the same status as my built-in metrics. I can bring it to my dashboards, it will be refreshed and so on and so forth. So I'll click create, this will start working in the background, and eventually what I'll see is this dashboard. I configured this dashboard again exactly using the same parameters that I showed you here. Um, same story as the previous case. Uh, we're gonna compute all the metrics in the background and we're going to store them in these uh, output tables. The difference is that we now have different metrics that are shown here, right? Because this is a machine, uh, this is a dashboard on a different table, we get metrics for the quality of the model, uh, for regression and classification. And also another difference is that um, we get this fairness and bias metrics that I mentioned earlier. Uh, to see them, I have to select the slice for which I want to uh, see those metrics. So this is the gender is equal to zero. Uh, slice that you saw me uh, input uh, earlier. And just so that it's clear, you can have many slicing expressions. I gave you examples with a single expression at a time, but you can actually select several, you can specify several of them, and each one gives you a different segmentation of the metrics. So let me apply this, and then scroll down to the dashboards. It will take some time to update. But on this uh, section of the dashboard, we'll see the uh, metrics for fairness and bias. We currently compute uh, for those metrics. Uh, some of them require ground truth labels, the other ones uh, don't. Uh, these metrics basically give you uh, a different 
picture of uh, bias and fairness uh, on the data. And we plan to add more metrics as we go. This is just the starting set that we thought gave us good coverage. And what we can see here on the side of the dashboard is for this particular slice, uh, and here I can select which bias metric I want to examine, um, how does my model uh, do with respect also to the different predictions of the model? So blue here is the no churn prediction, red is the churn prediction, and uh, this chart shows me uh, the ratio in each case between my protected group and the uh, other groups. And I can see that this ratio hovers around one in, in these cases, which is good. This is what I would expect from a fair unbiased model to do. But if I go to the last window, we'll see that the ratio is one for the churn predictions, but it's significantly lower for the no churn predictions. So now I'm getting um, a sense that, okay, the, um, the model is biased against gender equals zero for a specific class for predictions, right? So I have some further information uh, that can help me uh, uh, take it further. Okay, and this uh, completes uh, the demo. So I'll switch back to slides uh, to wrap this up. So what we've done so far with uh, Lakehouse Monitoring is that we, we now have an integrated platform inside the Lakehouse, which gives us out-of-the-box quality metrics for our data and AI assets, so that I can monitor them in a uniform and consistent way. I can add custom metrics to tie machine learned, um, my, machine learned my, machine, my model prediction, sorry, to business line metrics, and auto-generated dashboards to visualize them. Um, I can get alerts, and I can also look how uh, these alerts occur over the lineage graph to facilitate root cause analysis. And I'll give you okay. a Okay, in the last 20 seconds, I'm just gonna really quickly go through what's next. Okay, so what we just showed you is essentially, this is my kind of ugly diagram to show it, but we can monitor any kind of table and models with the same monitoring solution, agnostic of whatever framework they were created with or where they're hosted. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna create delta tables with your metrics in them in your account. Then we're gonna also auto -gen generate a dashboard on top to help you visualize. So that's what the monitoring service is that's going public preview very soon this fall, um, early fall. Uh, and you can set alerts on top of this. This is only the first step though. Like I painted that like beautiful dream of where we're going. So let me show you next like, where we're actually trying to build towards in order to accomplish that beautiful dream. So the first step of what we've built was this monitoring service. That's public previewing. We're gonna try GA as soon as possible. The next thing is to try to unify expectations. So those of you who have used DLT are familiar with sort of the expectations framework. We're now wanting to now extend that to work with all delta tables. So expectations will be built into your delta table metadata. So you can set what you expect all your data quality to be like on the table level itself. From there, we now need to integrate with orchestration. So that way you can say, hey, uh, if I have a data quality issue, I wanna fail the pipeline. So the data doesn't even get written, or I want you to drop these records. So it's similar to DLT, but now expanding it to work with any Delta table uh, as well. Obviously, you'll get the best experience with DLT. DLT will allow you when you have an uh, expectation that has to do with the entire table already being written, like the percent of nulls has changed dramatically. The whole table's written before you actually know that expectation got uh, violated, DLT will automatically have the way to like, roll it back for you. If you use some other orchestration tool, you won't have that. Um, so we always recommend DLT as like the best in class experience for that when you're gonna, uh, working with data quality and orchestration. And the last thing is actually building an ecosystem of this. Monitoring really is just a generic service, right? It's a service crawling over your data sets, doing incremental processing, generating metrics. So from there, we should be able to do that for anything, PII detection, anomaly detection. And it'd be nice if we could even open that up to an ecosystem where you have your proprietary you know, analysis that you wanna do, and you can just plug into our service. And so that's what we're trying to build towards um, with all of this. Uh, yep, yeah, well, we're definitely way over time, uh, but if you have questions, Alex and I will probably be hanging out in the back. Uh, feel free to come up to us, ask us anything. I think our emails are just our names at Databricks, so feel free to reach out there as well. Um, but we're very excited about this product and integrating data quality into the Lakehouse platform as a first-class experience. I hope you learned a lot today, uh, and we're very excited about this. Thank you.